Okay, folks, let's get started. As you can see, I finally got the grades posted. Um, I haven't quite yet posted. I haven't quite yet posted the highlights uh, from Friday, but I will get those posted shortly. Okay, folks, a little chatter. Can we just listen? Um, and this actually is, a, I, I talked about how students sort of sort themselves. This is a pretty good example of the sorting that happens. When I assign grades, I look for, for breaks, natural breaks. So this is how people sort themselves. So here's a break. Here's a break. Here's a break. Here's a break. Okay? And so it's not so much me assigning grades as much as it is identifying those breaks uh, where people have sorted themselves into. Now, um, if I were assigning grades today, that's roughly how I would assign them. There's two places on here where I would say, ah, the breaks aren't really quite clear. One would be right here, um, which I thought was a little off. That, that could be here. That could be here. And the other was actually down here. These two, with respect to that, I'm not quite sure where that would fit in. So that's the variable areas. But you can see pretty much where things are on the uh, distribution from where you stand. The numbers here correspond to the number of people who received that grade. So if you had a person at 100 here, all right, well, this is the sum of the two scores. There's two people that got that score in the class. OK, so look it over. And if you have questions or anything, of course, always let me know. So last time I talked about biotechnology and some of the t uh, cool techniques that we use uh, to uh, investigate things in the laboratory. I want to say, uh, I want to talk about uh, two things here today that are uh, relevant to our studies. Um, and one is, some, is a technique that I don't believe I talked about with respect to protein isolations. I don't think I talked about histidine tagging, did I? Yeah, I didn't think so. So I want to say a little bit about histidine tagging uh, here today. And then I want to talk about a, um, a uh, technique called the polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, because it enters into a lot of things. So you'll see there are several things on here I'm not going to talk about, and you will not be responsible for them if I don't talk about them. So uh, that's my uh, plan. Histidine tagging turns out to be um, a really powerful tool for isolating things, uh, typically proteins. And histidine tagging is useful. It's, it's, it's related to uh, affinity chromatography. It's related to that. So with affinity chromatography, you may remember that we um, were able to isolate proteins on the basis of things that they bound to. So I gave the example in class, if I had proteins that bound to ATP and I wanted to isolate them, then I would take those little beads and I would put, the lo put on the, those little beads in ATP, and then I would pass my mixture of proteins through it, and then all the proteins that bound to ATP would bind to that column and everything else would come running through. And then I would add ATP to elute uh, the proteins, and I would be uh, set. Okay. Now, um, histidine tagging relies on affinity for something. Okay. So we've got a sort of an unnatural affinity that we build into this. And I'm not, so I need to explain this uh, to you. The reason I talked about it here is it requires some genetic engineering and a little bit of knowledge about your protein in order to uh, perform this technique. So let's say that we are interested in one of my favorite ones to talk about, which is human growth hormone. That's a, that's a protein uh, that we make, and it's necessary for us to grow. Uh, people who have deficiencies of human, human growth hormone uh, will uh, have very stunted growth. And so now it's available as a recombinant uh, molecule that we can uh, buy and people can take uh, to uh, help deal with those um, issues uh, of low human growth hormone. So let's say I've got a protein. I know what uh, the amino acid sequence is of that protein. I, I have a copy of the gene. And so let's say it's human growth pro uh, hormone. And what I want to do is I want bacteria to make a whole bunch of human growth hormone. But being a lazy biochemist, I want to make the purification very simple. And to do that, I use a technique called histidine tagging. So with histidine tagging, I have to, first of all, know or have the gene that I'm interested in purifying the protein of. Okay? So let's say this is uh, the gene right here. I would put this into an expression vector, because in the expression vector, I would have 
a promoter that would transcribe uh, the relevant region, in this case the gene of interest. Uh, and this could be going in either direction, by the way. I would also add to that coding for the protein, I would add a short segment of histidine residues. So typically they're about six or eight residues long. And they become a part of the protein. So we put it with the coding region of the protein so that these histidine uh, amino acids are attached to the coding for the protein. So the cell doesn't know. It just goes ahead and makes a bunch of histidines and puts them uh, attached to the protein. So when I put that in the cells and I let transcription and translation occur, what happens is my recombinant protein that I've made has the protein that I'm interested, the green being the human growth hormone, and the red being the little tiny histidine tag at the end of it. And this can be either at the carboxyl end or the amino end. It doesn't really matter. Okay? The main thing is it's got a sequence of histidines that are sitting there. Well, the reason for doing this is these histidines have affinity for the ion nickel. Okay? They have an affinity for the ion nickel. So instead of making a column of ATP, I make a column that contains nickel. And so what's going to happen if I take this mixture of all these cellular proteins and I pour it through this nickel column? Well, what's going to happen is only those proteins that have a histidine tag, we call it a histidine tag, by the way, are going to stick. Everything else is going to come through. Well, the cell doesn't normally have any proteins that have a sequence of histidines that will bind this nickel column. So when I pass this guy through, you'll see that all the cellular proteins come scooting through, and the um, um, recombinant proteins that contain the histidine tag are stuck to the column. So I've effectively separated those. There's a couple of ways that I could get these off of here, because this is not a covalent bond, remember, that we could pull this off of this, and we would have our purified protein. Now, you might say, OK, well, that's really nice, but this protein now isn't exactly like human growth hormone because it's got a set of histidines on the end of it. Isn't that going to cause a problem if we put this into a person? The answer is it could. So fortunately, we have a protease that will recognize the histidines and cut them off. It'll just cut them off. So when once we've done that, we have our pure protein in a pure form that we can then use, now minus the reds at the end. So it's a very simple way to purify a protein. It's a very powerful technique, because literally in one step, I've got the protein that I'm after. And if I use bacterial cells, or in some cases we use yeast cells, it depends on, on what we're trying to do, we uh, can make a lot of this protein very, very cheaply. Well, that's really good if you're a, a, a pharmaceutical company, because the cheaper you can make your products, I was going to say the cheaper you can make your drugs, but we know that, we know that never happens. So um, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't joke about that, but, it, but that's a, a sad fact of life. Yes, Maria. There's a protease that will cut it off. Yeah, just to, for all you need to know, it's just simply a protease. So nickel, nickel uh, I'm sorry, uh, histidine tagging is a very powerful way to isolate uh, proteins. Yes? Why wouldn't you just make the column of the Oh, that's a good question. Why not rinse the column with the protease? That's one of the ways you actually could do that. It's not real efficient, though, because in the environment of the column, the protease may not be maximally active. But you could do that. It's a very good question, very good question. OK. Well, the last biotechnique that I want to talk about um, is the polymerase chain reaction. It's called PCR. I'm sure many of you have heard of it. How many people in here have heard of PCR? Almost everybody. OK. So the polymerase chain reaction uh, was a technique that was invented by a man named Dr. Kerry Mullis. You don't need to know that. Uh, driving back to his uh, home in Malibu back in the uh, mid-1980s. And he had the idea that he could use uh, the techniques of the cell to amplify DNA. 
And you might say, well, why do you want to amplify DNA? And the answer is as follows. I told you that the human, um, the human uh, genome is about seven feet in physical size. Okay, so every, every cell of your body has seven feet of that. Let's imagine we took that seven feet of DNA and we stretched it out all the way around this room. Okay, all the way around this. So we've actually ma made it, you know, stretched out. So we're taking things that are already fairly small and stretching them out. How big do you suppose an average gene would be on the wall of this room? Less than a millimeter. It would be less than a millimeter. Okay? So now we start thinking about if that's the size of the DNA and an average gene that I want to work with is less than a millimeter, then there's an awful lot of stuff there that I don't want compared to, all, to, to the one gene that I do want. So amplification becomes powerful then because by making thousands, millions, and ultimately billions of copies of that gene, I actually can have more of that particular gene than I have of all the other junk. That as far as I'm concerned is junk, right? Because I'm only interested in one gene. So PCR is very powerful. It's also very powerful at a crime scene. You've seen the crime shows and so forth, and you get a tiny droplet of blood or sweat or a piece of a hair or something like that. In that case, we have vanishingly small quantities of DNA, and we want to amplify it so that we have many copies that we can study and determine who committed the crime, et cetera, et cetera. PCR is also very, very useful for that. And PCR has, mil I shouldn't say millions, but thousands and thousands of uses. So it's appropriate that we should understand something about how PCR works and what PCR does. Well, as I said, the PCR technique is rooted in the um, replication of DNA within a cell. To do PCR, one proceeds through a series of reactions, like I'm going to describe to you here and like you'll see on the screen. Uh, and in this series of reactions, we're actually stealing ideas from how the cell does something. To start with, I am typically interested in amplifying a very tiny section of a much bigger DNA. In fact, almost always that's what I'm interested in doing. The beauty of PCR is that I can specify what section I will amplify, okay? and I can uh, uh, do that amplification literally in a couple of hours. So that I can go from one copy of something to over a billion copies in a couple of hours. Right? That's really remarkable. So how do we do that? Well, to do that, first of all, we have to be able to specify the region of DNA that we're interested in, which means that we need to know some DNA sequence for the thing that we want to amplify. So let's imagine that we are interested in the human growth hormone. I know the sequence of the human growth hormone. And so I've got a batch of human DNA, and I tell a student, well, go ahead and pull out the, co the, the coding region for the human growth hormone for me so we can use it in our laboratory. Okay? Not an uncommon request, not an uncommon thing to do. So the student would go to the database and look up the sequence of the human growth hormone, the, the, the coding region for the human growth hormone. Okay? And they would say, okay, well, here's this region uh, of sequence over here at the five prime end. And here's another region of sequence over here at the three prime end. And we're going to pick a region of about 20 to 25 nucleotides and make a sequence that's complementary to the sequence at the five prime end. And we're going to go over here to the three prime end, and we're going to make a short sequence of about 20 to 25 nucleotides that's complementary to the three prime end. Okay? Now, why have I done that? Well, I've just described chemically synthesizing a primer. Remember, DNA polymerases require a primer. And remember that DNA polymerases will only replicate from a primer. They won't start replication on their own. So they're different from RNA polymerases. Okay? So I've got a primer defining one end of the DNA I want to amplify. And I've got a primer at the other end, all right, that's complementary to the other end of the DNA I want to amplify. And the primers are oriented, so they point at each other. 
One gets one strand, the other gets the other strand. Okay? And that's what I'm getting ready to do here. So I take a mixture of the DNA that I want to amplify, and I add the two primers in great excess. Okay? Millions of fold times more of the primer than I have of the DNA. Because remember, I'm going to make millions or billions of copies of that DNA. I'm going to take one primer for each one of them. Okay. The third thing I'm going to put in there is I'm going to put a DNA polymerase in there. Because the DNA polymerase is going to be necessary to do the replication. That's the work of the process. And the fourth thing I'm going to need is I'm going to need some DNTPs. I'll need DATP, DGTP, DCTP, and DTTP, because that's what DNA polymerase is going to want to replicate with. Now, the only thing I haven't told you is that I need to use a special kind of DNA polymerase. And the special kind of DNA polymerase that I use comes from an exotic organism called Thermus aquaticus. You don't need to know that. Okay? Thermus aquaticus is an organism that lives in the boiling waters of a sulfur pit, or uh, some sort of sulfur pit, in Yellowstone National Park. That's where it was discovered. And this, why do I pick that? Well, I picked that because this organism actually replicates at temperatures near boiling temperatures of water, which means that they have to have a DNA polymerase that is stable at that temperature. So we're using a DNA polymerase that comes from Thermus aquaticus. And in a minute, I'll tell you why it's important that we have that. But suffice it to say, we're using a DNA polymerase that is stable at near boiling temperatures that comes from Thermus aquaticus. The DNA polymerase whose name you should know is called TAC, T-A-Q. That's where Thermus aquaticus comes in. It's called TAC DNA polymerase. OK. Now, I'm ready to start my reaction. How do I start the reaction? Well, if I, if I add primers, and I add polymerase, and I add DNTPs to that mixture, and I say, go forth and multiply, nothing's going to happen. And the reason nothing is going to happen is because in the cell, we have to pull the strands apart, remember? And the helicase does that for us. We don't have a helicase in here. We've got to pull the strands apart. Well, the best way to pull the strands apart is to boil them. If I boil the DNA, the strands will come apart because the hydrogen bonds will break. And when the hydrogen bonds break, the strands separate. This is why we have to have a DNA polymerase that doesn't fall apart when you boil it. Right? I boil it. And now I've got single strands. Then I create conditions in the tube, which basically involves cooling it down to what's called an annealing temperature. That's A-N-N-E-A-L-I-N-G. I cool it down to an annealing temperature. And at that temperature, the primers will find their complementary region on a DNA strand. And they do. So imagine I've got a top strand over here that's got a primer on it pointed this way. And I've got a bottom strand that's got a primer on it over here pointed this way. And now I set conditions for the polymerase to do its thing. So the polymerase is going to replicate, right? I started with two strands of my sequence of interest, and now I've got four. Gone from two, I've primed them, I now have four. And yes, the sequences do go on past that, but over time, they get shortened to this, this size. I can show you why if you'd like to see why. Okay. The next cycle, what do I do? Well, I repeat it. I boil, I anneal, I replicate. And I end up now with eight strands. I boil, I anneal, I replicate, I end up with 16 strands. Every cycle that I do this process theoretically doubles the number of strands of DNA that I've got of my sequence. And the beautiful thing here is I'm only replicating the sequence of interest. Yes, sir. We're not using RNA primers. Good question. We're using DNA primers. I should have said that. Thank you for pointing that out. So the primers that I have the person make in the laboratory are DNA primers because as 
your name again is, as John said, all right, if I used RNA primers, I'd be in trouble, right? But I can use DNA primers. Cells will, I mean, the polymerases will accept DNA primers without any problem. So I use DNA primers, so now the replication goes all the way to the end, so it doesn't get shorter each time. Very good. Does that make sense? Most people are saying yes. If you do this cycle, it's this, this reaction is typically done for about 30 cycles. At the end of 30 cycles, theoretically, you have over a billion times more DNA than you had that you, that you started with. Over a billion times. Now, in, in reality, you get probably 50 million times, but that's probably mostly limited by the number of primers that you put in the reaction, not by the reaction itself. Okay? Yes? Okay, remind you why we're adding all the DATP, DGTP, etc. That's necessary for making the DNA. Because the polymerase has to use the building blocks to make the DNA, and the building blocks are DATP, DGTP, DCTP, and DTTP. Yeah, you can, you can chemically synthesize those in a lab term. Yeah. Well, PCR, as I said, is used in, in um, uh, forensic investigations. It's used. Uh, for paternity determination. It's used for um, uh, ancient DNA samples. Uh, there's a lot of interest right now because they've recently shown that they're actually able to identify uh, where humans have been. Like in a cave, there was a recent archaeological site where they had, they had no bones, uh, but they were able to show that there were, there were Neanderthals that had lived in the cave because they were able to identify through PCR Neanderthal DNA uh, within there. And these are things that have been, you know, extinct for thousands and thousands of years. So archaeological use of this is also a very, very powerful uh, tool. When people examined Kennewick Man, the, the, the um, uh, skeleton that they found up in the Columbia River Gorge, they analyzed it to see what its um, uh, ancestor, a ancestry was. That is, what the um, uh, major ethnic groups were that it was related to based on its DNA sequence. So pretty cool stuff. Questions? All right, um, I think we'll stop there um, with respect to biotechniques. We're not going to stop, don't worry. Um, and we'll turn our attention to s some other cool stuff to be thinking about. And they're actually a little bit related uh, because some of the stuff I'm going to talk about actually do have applications uh, for biotechnology and for human health, improving human health, uh, that I will discuss. The first thing I want to talk about um, uh, is, the, is the category uh, of viruses. Well, viruses, of course, we all know are uh, uh, genetic elements that are apart from a living cell. They have, in some cases, uh, really incredible structures. Viruses are really good examples of what I describe as self-assembling machines. Selfish assembling machines. Imagine, if you will, that you took a jigsaw puzzle and you laid all the pieces out on the table and the pieces assembled themselves into a final jigsaw puzzle. Pretty crazy to think of, right? However, a virus, by having all the pieces necessary for making up a protein coat, can actually assemble, self-assemble those pieces into a functional virus inside of which are, nucleic, are the nucleic acids of the virus, whether that's DNA or RNA. So this is a really uh, impressive um, nanotechnology that's out there. Most viruses, not all viruses, but most viruses have a regular structure. And you can see there's some regularity to the structure. It looks kind of like a, uh, a, a mine or something uh, with these various projections uh, sticking off of it. Here's some other uh, representations. And sometimes they put, you'll see an interpretive drawing like this. Interpretive drawing is to show really what we know in terms of the structure of this, although this is a, a visual image, and this is, uh, would be obtained from other information. But you can see the sort of regular structure associated with this. This is a virus that I, for example, worked on for my PhD called adenovirus. And adenovirus is a virus that causes uh, cold and flu symptoms. It's common. Most people have. Um, a um, form of adenovirus they walk around with in their 
uh, through it all the time. Um, there's a, a sort of a fibrous virus, and you can see that it's just a regular coil with uh, various proteins covering. And there's, there's quite a wide variety of structures that are there. This happens to be an RNA virus called tobacco, tobacco mosaic virus that's fairly uh, readily studied. Viruses come in uh, forms that contain, as their nucleic acid, double-stranded DNA. Some contain single-stranded DNA. And you can see some of the double-stranded DNA containing viruses. There's the adenoviruses that I worked with. Um, there's uh, the uh, monovirus, Epstein-Barr uh, virus that's there, herpes simplex, which causes cold sores. And then there's another form of herpes simplex that's uh, associated with genital herpes. Um, these, um, uh, what else do I want to say? These guys here, uh, uh, viruses, uh, include things like parvovirus that will affect uh, dogs um, uh, very uh, severely, and quite a wide variety of them. RNA-containing viruses uh, can also be in either a single-stranded form or in a double-stranded form. And as you might imagine, an RNA virus has usually a little bit of an unusual aspect to its life cycle. Because a DNA virus, we could imagine um, all the cellular machinery, for example, the DNA replication and the, the uh, transcription and so forth, could use and or borrow components of the um, cell. Many uh, viruses, like um, uh, adenovirus, for example, uses its own DNA polymerase. Uh, but they can also, some viruses also will use a cellular polymerase uh, as well. The RNA-containing uh, viruses um, are uh, nasty in some cases. Uh, you see, for example, there's dengue fever. Hepatitis C is an RNA virus. Um, the uh, encephalitis uh, virus, which is a very uh, nasty uh, virus uh, uh, to uh, contract, is there. And we see measles and mumps also appearing uh, in there. Flu virus is also an RNA virus. Yes? There are innocuous viruses, yes. Yeah, you don't see uh, severe symptoms in s with some viruses. Um, but um, there, every virus is going to have some kind of an impact based on the fact that it is killing a cell, typically, in its replication cycle. So there will be usually some kind of impact, but you can imagine that some of those are, are, are more severe than others are. OK. Um, the life cycle of a virus, um, I've drawn one life cycle of a virus uh, up here. In this life cycle, we see that uh, some essential elements to how a, a virus uh, proceeds. First of all, it has to attach to a cell, and it has to somehow get its nucleic acid into the cell. Okay? It has to attach and get its nucleic acid somehow into the cell. Now, we see this attachment usually in the, in the form of some molecule that's on the outer surface of the virus. Remember, the viruses typically will have a protein coat on the outside and a nucleic acid on the inside. They will almost always have that kind of a structure. So the protein coat then becomes very important in terms of interacting with a cell because the protein coat has to interact with that cell to get the nucleic acid inside. And so commonly, we'll see proteins on the surface that will bind to structures on the cell surface. Those structures can be proteins. Those structures can be other things that are on the cell surface that these are binding to so that they can then attach and inject their nucleic acid into the cell. After the nucleic acid has gotten into the cell, what happens to it is going to depend to what kind of uh, nucleic acid it is. If it's, for example, a single-stranded RNA, in some cases, that single-stranded RNA will be translated directly. Okay? Very, very simple. And of course, it would have to replicate. There would have to be some uh, proteins to replicate. But one of the proteins that's made might be an RNA-directed RNA polymerase that could then make more copies of it. Okay? On the other hand, if we had things like a double-stranded DNA virus like we have here, then we would have to have a transcription, translation of those um, uh, viral proteins before the virus could assemble. So there's a variety of ways that this process can happen depending upon the nature of the nucleic acid. But the important thing is uh, where that they'll all have in common is down here. At some point, the viral proteins will have been made within the cell 
through translation. And those viral proteins then assemble through that process that I described before that can literally self-assemble to make an overall structure that now contains the replicated uh, nucleic acid. So remember that the replication of the nucleic acid has to also happen in order for the virus to have a productive uh, infection. The um, way that the virus uh, gets out of the cell is quite varied. Um, but this shows it simply as bursting the cell open. And when it bursts open, all these newly made viruses that were in there exit the cell and go on and infect other cells. I should point out that the flu virus, uh, which is, um, a, as you know, an important um, uh, health consideration for the world, the uh, flu virus actually, um, its exit is re is, uh, can be um, uh, limited by a drug. Um, so the exit of the flu virus from a cell can be, ex can be limited by a drug called Tamiflu. So if you've ever, ever heard of Tamiflu, what it does is it inhibits the release of the virus uh, from a cell. Now, as we will see, cells aren't, pa aren't completely passive in this process. Cells have a means of telling other cells in the body, that is, if we're a multicellular organism, they have a way of telling other cells in the organism, hey, I'm infected. And that means kill me. But not only does it mean kill me, but it means here's what infected me. And they communicate that information that's ultimately read by the immune system. So an infected cell has two responsibilities. One is to tell the rest of the organism I'm infected. The other is to pass on the information about what infected it so that the immune system has a chance. Now, if this happens before that happens, of course, the virus has gone and caused other problems, et cetera. So it's a race between the cell communicating that information and these guys getting out. Maria. Yes. So her question is, are there viruses that can integrate their nucleic acid into the DNA? And she's reading my mind because that's the next thing that's coming up. So this is one life cycle for a virus. There are other life cycles for viruses. And one of those is exhibited by HIV. So HIV, of course, is the virus that's responsible for causing uh, the disease known as AIDS in uh, people. And HIV um, goes through a, a cycle that adds another component to its life cycle besides what I've shown you here. So I'm going to step in and show you that in just a minute. The HIV virus has a structure that looks um, something like this. HIV virus is what we call a retrovirus. It has an RNA genome. And because of that RNA genome, it goes through some additional steps in order to replicate and to integrate into the cellular genome. It has uh, proteins on the surface that will help the virus to bind to target cells and inject its nucleic acid. In addition to the um, uh, nucleic acid that gets injected by the HIV virus into a target cell, there are also proteins that are carried in here that are injected as well. One protein is known as integrase. And you can see that protein uh, right there. Another is an enzyme known as reverse transcriptase, which I've talked about earlier. I'll remind you that this is a DNA polymerase that copies RNA and makes DNA. Okay, so I'm going kind of fast. I'll slow down. Reverse transcriptase is a DNA polymerase that copies RNA and makes DNA from it. And that turns out to be an essential part of the HIV life cycle. The integrase here I'll talk about uh, as I get talking about the life cycle in just a second. Yes, Mariah. So it's an RNA polymerase that copies Okay. So this is a DNA polymerase that copies RNA and makes DNA. So reverse transcriptase is a DNA polymerase, copies RNA, and makes DNA from it. The other protein is integrase, and I'll talk about that as we get going in, OK? OK. 
what does the life cycle of HIV look like? Well, part of the life cycle is shown here. We don't see the injection. We can see, imagine we're looking inside of a cell right now. We don't see the injection in, and we don't see all the translation and all that sort of stuff. Instead, we're following the nucleic acid, because the nucleic acid is the critical uh, component here. How does that work? Well, let's imagine that this is a cell, and we've had the HIV virus attach. And the HIV virus has injected this uh, RNA into the cell. It has also injected a couple of things in with it. One is a reverse transcriptase, and one is an enzyme known as integrase. So those are the two enzymes that we're going to be concerned about here. The RNA virus, I'm sorry, the RNA genome contains at its end, at its ends, something called long terminal repeats, or LTRs. These are sequences that are repeated. They're not quite telomeres, but they are repeated sequences at the end. Okay. These LTRs turn out to play important roles later in transcription. But suffice it to say that the first step in the life cycle after the RNA has gotten into the cell is that the RNA is converted into double-stranded DNA using reverse transcriptase. So we've gone from RNA to double-stranded DNA down here. Now, the next step in the process, or the next step in the life cycle of this cell, is that this double-stranded DNA will be integrated into the host genome. This is what Mariah is asking about. Integrated, meaning that it will be inserted someplace in a host chromosome okay, and become a part of the host chromosome. Gets inserted into the host chromosome and becomes a part of the host chromosome. So here's our cell. Everything outside of here was part of the, chromo the host chromosome that was originally attached to each other, but now it's had this insertion of the HIV double-stranded DNA into it. That integration is catalyzed by the enzyme integrase. Now, once this has happened, this cell is in some deep doo doo. This is happening in T cells of the immune system. We'll talk about the immune system uh, a little bit. It's happening in T cells of the immune system. Okay? In these T cells, what's happening is T cells have to replicate. T cells, as they replicate, every time they replicate, what's going to happen? Every new cell that comes from this is going to contain a copy of HIV, right? Well, that's not bad unless HIV somehow gets transcribed. Because when HIV gets transcribed, what's going to happen? It's going to make viral RNA, right? Well, what does it take to transcribe a gene? You guys know it takes a promoter. And what did I tell you was a strong promoter? The LTRs. Sitting here in this host genome is a time bomb. The time bomb is once this gets activated, you start making RNA. When you start making RNA, two things can happen. One is you can go back and repeat this process over and over. The second is you can translate that RNA and start making viral proteins that now start packaging up HIV. Long terminal repeat. LTR stands for long terminal repeat. Yes, sir. Yes. There, it has been demonstrated just recently. There's a technique called CRISPR that I won't go into here, but a technique called CRISPR that can precisely cut at a desired uh, section of DNA. And I think they have made a mouse that is now completely HIV-free using CRISPR technology. It's complicated, but they have actually, it's the first time it's actually been demonstrated. Yes. OK, well, you begin to see the problem here, because how do you get rid of this thing? If you don't have a sophisticated restriction enzyme, 
to cut this guy out of here, you got trouble. And think of all the billions of cells that you have that are now containing and carrying this. If you're going to make an organism free of this, you would have to take every single one of those cells and cut precisely the thing out that you want. That's problematic. It's probably something that though we might be able to do it in a mouse, it's probably going to be prohibitive in a human being. There's bound to be side effects. There's bound to be uh, some problems associated with that. And it's bound to be less than 100% efficient. Well, what if, it's, what if you get 99%? Isn't that good? No, because over time, what's going to happen? It just goes back and infects more cells and starts making more copies of this. Yes, Moran. OK, at what point does HIV become AIDS? AIDS is a physiological phenomenon of, that a person succumbs to when their immune system gets to a certain point. Okay, So it's more defined by the status of the immune system than it is defined by the status of the HIV. But the HIV, of course, is what brings that on. Yeah. Is there a question over here? Yes. Yes, good question. Can the virus integrate in multiple places in an organism, in a cell? And the answer is yes, it can. It will also tend to integrate into relatively random places. You could imagine if you integrated next to some critical gene or in the middle of some critical gene, you kill that cell. Okay. Killing that cell might not be all that bad. But what if you integrated next to something that caused the cell to divide uncontrollably? You might cause a cancer. So. These viruses are somewhat what we call oncogenic. Retroviruses are oncogenic in the sense that they can, in fact, stimulate a, a, a cancer uh, occurring. And I'll talk a little bit about that, not today, but, but next time. Okay. Yes? So this happens in helper T cells. It also can happen in killer T cells. Yes? Okay. Good. She's reading my mind. Amy's reading my mind. So what do HIV drugs do? Well, we could imagine that if we want to stop a virus, if we stop various steps in the virus, that we could really limit the ability of the virus to proliferate and to go out and cause the problems that we see with the immune system. So HIV uh, drugs tend to tackle three different things. Yes, I think these are important. Okay, One. Many of the drugs are inhibitors of reverse transcriptase. They inhibit the ability of this enzyme to do its thing. So if the, if the reverse transcriptase can't replicate, then you can really limit how many cells are infected. right? It's not continuing to make more and more and more infected cells because you stop it right here. You still have infected cells, right? but you're not continuing this process. That's one thing. A second thing they target is integrase, because if it can't integrate, it can't go through its life cycle. And the third thing that is used as drug, uh, drug in drug design for, against HIV is inhibiting the ability of the virus protein coat to self-assemble. Now, I'll tell you how that goes. One of the things that has to happen during the assembly of a protein coat for almost any virus is that there's a protease, or there are proteases, that have to clip little pieces off that allow for the assembly to occur. So it'd be like having a jigsaw puzzle that has a little thing sticking off of each piece that in order for you to put the puzzle together, you've got to take a pair of scissors and cut that thing off. Otherwise, there's no way of putting the pieces together. So that's what the proteases in a cell are doing, is they're cutting off those little, the, the proteases in a virus are doing, is they're cutting off the little pieces that prevent self-assembly. So once you cut them off, it can self-assemble. If you inhibit their ability to work, then that piece can't get cut off and the virus can't self-assemble. So the third category is what are called protease inhibitors. You may have heard of those. Protease inhibitors inhibit the ability of the virus to make a viable, a viable infective protein. Okay. Now, the drugs aren't perfect. Why aren't they perfect? Well, they aren't perfect because 
this guy, what did I say about this guy when I talked about reverse transcriptase earlier? Anybody remember? With respect to the DNA polymerase? It lacks proofreading. It lacks proofreading. So what's it doing? It's making error, right? And the more errors, and by the way, RNA polymerase also makes errors because it doesn't have proofreading. So we have two phases where more errors can occur. As more errors occur, the viral RNA that's made is increasingly different, and the virus evolves its way around the drugs over time. That's what happens with HIV drugs. Now, fortunately, scientists have been able to continue to find new drugs to work around what the virus is doing, but it's a continual race between the two. Because of the, the antiviral drugs, and they're called a cocktail because they mix, use typically about three to five of these together and give them to patients, okay? Typically, this cocktail is powerful enough that you can reduce the viral, the detectable virus in an HIV person's blood to almost zero and keep people who have HIV he essentially healthy uh, because of that. Yes, John. They have to take the drugs forever. They have to take the drugs forever. And with, HIV, with, with a drug, you want to take it at exact time periods so you don't have ups and downs. You're, oh, I forgot to take my drug last night. That's not an acceptable uh, thing. So you have to be, uh, you, and one of the things you have to be able to do is demonstrate responsibility in taking the drugs as well. Yeah. Jade? Her question was, is it harder for an RNA virus to uh, say that it's infected? Uh, not that I know of, OK? Um, they, um, in this case, the cell would, oh, you're talking about with, with the, the integrated stuff here, right? Yeah. yeah, OK. So yes, I'm sorry, I, I didn't understand your question. So with a retrovirus, because this is integrated into the cellular genome, there's not an apparent infection that has happened. So. What will happen is the cell will just basically burst open without a lot of other signals. So yes, that is a potentially a problem with uh, a retrovirus, right? You said RNA virus, and not RNA virus. Not all. Most RNA viruses will, in fact, signal, but this is one example where there wouldn't be a very strong signal happening. So I misunderstood what you said. Clear as mud. Okay. Um, let me. Uh, make sure there's not something I'm missing here. Um, oh, we got one last thing I will say about this. So retroviruses are, you know, something you don't want to mess with. Okay, there's other retroviruses besides HIV. There's one called HTLV3 uh, that is um, one of the few known human tumor viruses that is directly linked to tumors. Uh, HIV is associated with some rare cancers. One's known as Kaposi sarcoma. Um, and, um, but HTLV3 is an infectious uh, virus that is fairly infectious that uh, is associated with causing tumors. So there are some retroviruses that are nasty and you don't want to mess with. What I was going to say about thinking about these nasty viruses is you say, well, I don't want to have anything to do with the retrovirus. But it turns out that retroviruses are actually strategies for some types of gene therapy. And the idea with the gene therapy is the retrovirus is bad if it goes through this whole cycle, but it's also good at something, and it's good at putting things into the genome. So what if you put or use a retrovirus to put a desired gene for, into a genome of a person who had a defective gene, let's say uh, uh, hemophilia? or uh, sickle cell anemia, something like that. Okay. If you are able to do that, retrovirus is great at putting things in. If you can stop the rest of the cycle from happening, then the person could, in theory, um, have a much more normal life. And that's been used in some strategies of gene therapy. There's other ways that they're approaching that now besides what I've described to you here. But there are some, some cool techniques relative to retroviruses and gene therapy. 
Okay, I've taken you almost to the end. I've got a song for you today uh, that is um, a biotechnique song. It's actually related to an earlier technique that we had. It's called I've Just Run a Gel. It's to the tune of an old uh, Beatles tune. I will lead it, but I don't know how well it's going to go. It goes. I've just run a gel. I do not know if it, it I, I do not think it went too well. I may have used a bit much SDS. The stacker's looking like a mess. It's true. Oh, now what will I do? The protein samples, my last one to purify. It was not fun. I spent three weekends working late. The middle lanes aren't looking great. I'm screwed. Good God, what will I do? Crawling, I'm almost bawling, the boss is calling to follow through. I just loaded all I've got to make this final western blot. My fingers are both crossed for sure, I hope my protein's product's pure, I do. Then my thesis is through, hating all of the waiting, I'm contemplating what I should do. Staining, my eyes are straining, there's no complaining, I say wahoo. Cause it has the band I need, I'll go and have it scanned to speed the writing of my thesis and proceed on to the postdoctoral plan. Oh, that will be so grand. Pieces make up my thesis, no more for Rhesus, the promised land. Riding, so unexciting, but no more biting my nails again. Riding is coinciding with reference sighting. I'm at the end. Okay, it's got a happy ending.